Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my talk will be a continuation of Mariusz's talk. Uh, so I will continue talking about Sarnak's conjecture and I will concentrate more on tools uh, that can be used to prove this conjecture in certain classes of dynamical systems. So this will be a certain orthogonality criterion that uh, goes back to Katai. So that's one of possible directions that you can take uh, to attack this conjecture. There are more, but uh, I picked up this one since I think that's interesting. So there are other possibilities, but let's stick to this. So what's our setup? We have a multipl multiplicative function that I will denote by f, so this can be Mebius function, Louisville function, but this is uh, more general, so let's just write f, and let's take uh, some arithmetic function a, so we have uh, function from integers to complex number numbers and let's assume it's bounded. So the question is when these two objects are, to, are orthogonal in some sense. So what I mean by orthogonality is this. So we look at the averages of a times f and we want them to go to zero. And uh, we are looking for a certain condition in terms of a only that will guarantee the orthogonality with respect uh, to all uh, multiplicative functions bounded by one, and this goes as follows. So we look at rescalings, uh, so time rescalings for A by different primes. We multiply this, and we want such averages to go to zero. So this is uh, what we need uh, to get our <coughs> assertion. And I said that this goes back to Katai, but in fact this goes back even further. So main ideas belong to Debussy and Delange and uh, Montgomery and Vaughan, that's 1982 and 1977, and in fact even further. So the ideas there uh, are related to the bi to bilinear method of, of Vinogradov, which is a technique to study sums of uh, arithmetic functions over primes via sums over progression, so sums like this and sums like this. So you can see that this and this uh, is related. And uh, this theorem was first proved by Katai in 1986 in this form. And then, uh, well, there was probably some progress, but uh, not from uh, the point of view of dynamics. And Recently, Burgen, Sarnak, and Ziegler reproved this criterion in a slightly different form. We'll see later uh, what I mean by this. So sometimes this criterion is referred to as D, D, B, K, S, Z criterion. So that will see the Lange, Burgen, Sarnak, Ziegler criterion, which I find way too long. That's why I went for this abbreviation. Yes? Quick question, so is it point-wise point -wise or uniform in P and Q? This, this is, uh, you just check it for all pairs, so there so is no soup here, nothing. So, or small may depend on P and Q. Yes. Uh, okay, so I will have Katai sort of nullity criteria, not this long thing. And also I'm not sure why to speak, uh, skip, for example, Vinogradov or Montgomery and Vaughan, so this should be even longer, right? So, yes. So this is our criterion, and I want to show you a proof of this, and if, in fact a proof of some generalization. So I have underlined here some parts that will change. So instead of bounded complex valued sequences, we will have uh, bounded sequences in Hilbert spaces. Instead of having well, these averages going to zero for all pairs of primes, uh, well, arbitrary pairs of distinct primes, will have pairs of distinct primes in some finite sets. So these sets pi, these are subsets of primes smaller or equal than y that are large in a sense. So if you look at the sum of reciprocals of all numbers in the set, this goes to infinity. So this kind of resembles the properties of primes. And finally, we want to drop uh, multiplicativity. So instead of uh, 
a multiplicative function. We still will still have function f, but there will be additional functions g1, g2, and h that kind of play the role of multiplicativity of f. So what I mean by this is, okay, so here in the middle we have f of np, and if p does not divide n and f was multiplicative, that this would be split into a product of two factors, f, f of n times f of p. We don't need to have this, but we have these bounds. So f gets replaced by g1 times h and g2 times h. And then, okay, so instead of these products, you have inner products and also in the assertion, uh, you look at the norm of, uh, of this element of your Hilbert space and uh, Okay, yes, this should be x here or n here, sorry. So there might be typos like this. So sometimes there will be x, sometimes capital N. You average uh, over whatever is uh, here. And there is, uh, of course, uh, some cost that we have to pay for dropping the multiplicativity, as multiplicativity assumption. Namely, there is an error that depends on how good our estimates are. Okay, so we, before we prove this, we need some tools. So suppose that uh, we have two arithmetic functions. We say that f has normal order g if for any epsilon, this set has zero asymptotic density. So what it means is that for most uh, arguments n, f and g roughly take the same value. So this can be used uh, in the following way. So suppose you have one complicated function and you know that uh, what its normal order is. This means that in some situations you can replace this complicated functions by some other simpler function. Okay, so let's uh, look at uh, one particular example, namely little omega. So this is the function that uh, checks how many prime divisors uh, your number has. This function is additive and, in fact, even strongly additive. And in 1917, Hardy and Ramanujan showed that this function has normal order log log n. Then later, in 1933, Turan proved the following inequality. So what does one of these statements uh, has to do with the other one? Well, if you look at this result, then it's not hard to prove that you get this inequality for any function psi that goes to infinity when x goes to infinity. And this already implies the result of Hardy and Ramanujan. So that's the relation. And then later this was extended to a large class of strongly additive function, then to a yet wider class, and finally to a wide class of, class of additive functions. So I don't want to go uh, more into this, but you can encounter many versions of this uh, uh, inequality, and it's usually referred to as uh, Turan-Fubilius inequality. Okay, so now I want to show you a particular version that will be useful uh, for proving uh, our version of Katai's orthogonality criterion. So this is the original statement. And uh, we need to rewrite it a little bit so to arrive at what we need. So first of all, I claim that we can reply, replace log log x here and here with the sum of reciprocals of primes, and this is by Merton's second theorem. So this difference uh, tends to a constant, and you can do uh, an elementary calculation that tells you that this is true whenever an analogous inequality with this sum of reciprocal of primes is true. Okay, so once we know that we don't need this log log x for which uh, it is unclear what to write if we don't we deal with uh, the whole set of primes uh, but uh, with some subset of it. Okay, so what's the setup? We have our finite subset of primes, and we can define function 
W, which plays the role of little omega. So it checks how many prime factors our number n has in this particular set of primes. And now m, this is just the sum of all reciprocals uh, of primes in our set. And I'm claiming that I have uh, this uh, well, inequality. How to get there? Well, that's uh, quite easy. So you look at the left-hand side and you expand it. So you will get uh, three terms like this. The next step is to understand uh, what is the product of, characteristic of these two characteristic functions. So if P is not equal to Q, we can just write uh, the characteristic fun one characteristic function. So we split the sum into two parts. The first one is for distinct pairs, P and Q. And the second one, well, if P is equal to Q, it becomes this. And I just write an upper bound where I ignore the fact that I'm not taking all primes, all pairs uh, here, just the distinct ones. So that's the first step. And then we use this estimate. So how many numbers smaller or equal than x are divisible by some given number s? So roughly s over s, uh, x over s, and the error is uh, of order big O of 1. So I apply this to s equal to pq and s equal to p, and I just add everything together. There is nothing more behind it. Uh, you can easily uh, do this later if you want. So this is how we get this version of turan cubilius inequality. And uh, actually, if you assume that you are taking longer and longer uh, parts uh, of uh, the set of primes without skipping any primes, then you will recover what was <coughs> here uh, with this expression. Okay, so let's continue with Katai's orthogonality criterion. Our goal is to prove that the norm of such sum has this size. So what do we have? Instead of having this norm, we can write the supremum over all use uh, elements of our Hilbert space of norm, smaller or Oops. something bad happened. Can you hear us? Let's wait. We uh, we hear you. Uh -huh. Everything to say with us, we hear you. Okay, so I will continue. So we take this uh, supremo and we can start working with it. So we fix uh, we fix u uh, with norm smaller or equal than one, and we will be looking at this absolute value. So if we are able to get estimates that do not depend on a particular u, but only on the fact that u has norm smaller or weak, equal than 1, then we will be fine. So let's start rewriting this. So what happens here in this first line is that I divide and multiply this by my, and I subtract and add wi, uh, wy of n, and I split it into two parts. Then I use the triangle inequality, and I have two parts that I need to estimate. So for estimating A, we'll use Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, the prime number theorem, and the fact that Y can be growing as slowly as we want. For estimating B, it's a similar story, but instead of prime number theorem, we'll use our version of turan kubilius inequality. Okay, so let's start with B since this is easier. So B looks like this, and the first step is to use Schwartz. And you can already see that there is a place where we can apply a Turan to Kubilius inequality. So we plug this in here. And in the second ingredient, each term is bounded. So we just need to look uh, at how many terms we are. So this is the bound we have so far. And now if y is growing very slowly, we can bound it in the following way. So again, this is, uh, this is just a short calculation to see that this is true. So, so we have a nice bound 
for B. So let's now concentrate on A, uh, which looks like this. So the first thing I do is I just put the definition of yi of n. This is the number of primes in my set py that divide n. And then I change the order of summation. So first I have a sum over p's and then sum over n's. And instead of requiring that p divides n, I just write explicitly n times p. And that's why the range of n's is different here and here. Okay, so now I want to use my assumptions. So I want to use my knowledge on F, and I have this, uh, these bounds that resemble uh, the multiplicativity condition. And, uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, they work only if P does not divide N. So I will use this if P does not divide N, and I need to look how many places I missed, so how many places there are that I do not control. So if I look at this difference, this is what it costs me. So the first part comes from the places uh, uh, that I don't control, and the second part comes from this multiplicativity-like uh, estimates. Uh, well, the distance between f and g1 times h is definitely smaller than the distance between g1 times h and g2 times h. That's why G2 suddenly uh, appears here. Okay, so what do we have? Our A is equal to one over MY. Then we have this expression where we replaced F by, by G1 times H. And these are our, our errors. So this is what you get when you sum these things together. Uh, you see there was an additional sum here which we haven't taken into account, account yet and we are doing it now. And if you sum these things and divide by m, you get this. All right, so now the next step is to divide uh, our set Py into dyadic subintervals. So Pky will be the elements of Py that are between 2 to k and 2 to k plus 1. And we were well, splitting this complicated ingredient into parts depending uh, in which uh, p, k, y we are. So I, I will denote these things by a, k, k, y. And now I will concentrate on getting a bound for this. So let me rewrite what a, k, y is. And let me change the order of summation once again. So this is what we get. And this means that for a fixed k, we get the following. So first of all, using the triangle inequality and cauchy schwartz uh, for inner product, we get this. Then if we apply cauchy schwartz again, but to a different space. So we get these two uh, square roots of sum of uh, squares. And uh, what happens next? So this first uh, part is easy because G1 is bounded. So you just look how many uh, summons there are. And in the second part, you expand the, uh, the norm. So this is what you get. And we happily start to see something that resembles our assumptions. So we see this inner product of U and P, U and Q. So there is hope that we'll finish soon. All right, so I change the order of summation once again. And since I put here P different than Q, since I don't have control over these inner products when P equals to Q, this costs me such an error. So this is just uh, the triangle inequality. So let us summarize what we have. A is equal to 1 over my, and then we have uh, this uh, sum of a, k, y, and we have already made at most such errors. So the estimates for a, k, y uh, from the previous page, when you plug this in, you get this. You have to believe me, I just put it there, nothing more happened. All right, so what happens next? First of all, you rewrite the last two terms. They are in here. 
and we are left with this long, complicated term. So what to do with this? So first of all, the prime number theorem, which tells you how many primes there are up to n, so this is roughly n over log n, tells us that this sum is bounded. And the, the other thing uh, that we use is that uh, pky is at most of size uh, 2 to k. This is a very rough estimate, but th these are just some primes in an interval of this length. So when you put this inside, so this is what goes here. So this 2 to power k over 2 becomes p, the size of pky. And this is uh, what is necessary to estimate the sum of these errors. So this is what you get. So we have this big O of x over my, and we are left with this part. I will just denote it by s, and we now want to estimate s. So now, if y is growing slowly, and by our assumption, this sum will be smaller or equal than x over y uh, log y squared. So, since s is smaller or equal than this expression, so I'm just plugging this in here, and uh, the size of pky is at most y because pky is a subset of py, and py, py are some primes that are smaller or equal than y, we get that s is smaller or equal than x over log y squared. Okay, so let's put everything together. We have this uh, long sum, and happily we notice that there is no k under this sum. So we just, uh, so this log y just gets cancelled out. Uh, this first ingredient becomes uh, big O of x over mi and gets eaten by the second ingredient. And there are only two ingredients of our error terms term at the end. Okay, so, f so far we have an estimate for a... Yes. Yeah, uh, can we switch to the presentation? Because now it's uh, virtually impossible to see slides. Oh? Yeah. 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 It's okay, yeah. yeah. So we'll be here. Yeah. We are sharing, we are sharing, we are sharing, the, sharing screen. the screen. We are sharing the screen. It seems that it's a problem on your side. So it's just the setup on your side. You have to make sure that you see the. Mm. We haven't touched anything since <laughs> the beginning. <laughs> At this. <laughs> this is the power of the formula. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are okay. Yeah, we are okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's continue. We have our estimates for A and for B. So I add them up. And I get this, right? So this term appears twice, there is nothing wrong about it. And uh, we noticed that our estimates did not depend on u itself, but only on the fact that the norm is bounded by one. So we can add the supremum here and finish the proof. So this is uh, how it goes. So let's, uh, let's uh, let us go now to the dynamical part and let us see some applications. So I will need some definitions. They already appeared in Mario's talk, in Vitali's talk, maybe in some others, but let me remind uh, you what's, what will be necessary for me. So X is a compact metric space and I have a homeomorphism acting on it. And this pair is called a topological dynamical system. So this is my, my basic object. On this compact metric space, I have uh, the, Borel, uh, the sigma algebra of Borel subsets, and I have the space of all probability Borel measures living on X. Uh, some of them are T invariant, which means that if I apply T or T inverse to, to my set, then, this, then its measure does not 
change. And now each choice of uh, uh, Borel prob probability invariant me measure gives me something called uh, a measure theoretic dynamical system. What are the basic examples? So first of all, you can think of uh, irrational rotation. There is just one invariant measure, which is the Lebesgue measure. You can think of the full shift over some, let's say, finite alphabet. We can stick to 0, 1 to z. So S is the map that shifts all sequences by one position to the left. So in this case, uh, the set of invar S invariant measures is, is rich. So it contains uh, measure the Dirac delta uh, at the sequence consisting of only of zeros or ones. There are measures concentrated on periodic points. There, there are different Bernoulli measures, Markov measures, well, whatever you want. Uh, so we have the full shift. We can also consider its subsystems. So whenever I have a closed S invariant uh, subset, I will call it a subshift. So for example, if you write your favorite sequence, you can look at its orbit then take the closure, so this will be an example of a subshift. All right, so suppose now that we have two measure theoretic dynamical systems. I will say that a measure on a product space x times y is a joining of these two measure theoretical dynamical systems if it's invariant under the product action t times s and it, if it has correct projections onto both coordinates. And the set of all joinings between T and S will be denoted by J of TS. This set is not empty because there is always at least the product measure sitting there. If this is the only measure, we say that T and S are disjoint. Okay, the next thing I need is the ergodicity. So I say that, so we say that the uh, uh, measure theoretical dynamical system is ergodic if there are no non trivial invariant subsets, which means from the measure theory point of view that if you apply T to your set, it will change at most by a set of measure zero. So the measure of such, such, set, such invariant sets is always either zero. I think I said something wrong. There are no non-trivial invariant subsets. So any invariant subset is always of measure zero or one. And the ergodicity of both TNS is necessary for it disjointness. So let's try to understand a bit more about this no notion. And for this, we need uh, a notion of a factor. So one uh, measure theoretic dynamical system is a factor of the other one. If there exists a map from X to Y, which is measurable and such that we have this uh, commuting relations. It's surjective map? Surjective. Yeah. Okay, so everything is uh, defined up to sets of measure zero. So you have uh, a measurable, measurable subset of X of full measure, uh, well, a subset of Y of full measure, and then this is uh, uh, where it all uh, happens. And suppose now that you have two systems that have a common factor, then they are not disjoint. Non trivial common factor, yes. So a singleton with identity is always a factor, so this is not what I had in mind. So, for example, uh, irrational rotation and the full shift with Bernoulli measure are always disjoint. And, uh, for example, so to give you another uh, example, two irrational rotations are disjoint if and only if the rotational, rotation al angles are rationally independent. So these are uh, some basic uh, example to illustrate uh, this. So now let me go for a while to spectral theory. So once you have a measure theoretical dynamical system, you can construct uh, its unitary counterpart. So what happens? Uh, the system X, B, mu, T, so actually this space where T is acting, X, B, mu, uh, can be used to construct uh, the L2, the corresponding L2 space. And on this space, we can define a unitary operator called uh, Koopman operator, which is just the composition of your functions uh, with T. And if T and S are isomorphic, then the corresponding Koopman operators are isomorphic uh, uh, in the unitary sense. So. Uh, 
in a way, we start with a maybe complicated object and we want to get something maybe simpler that can uh, tell us something about the properties. Uh, for example, how different these original systems are or maybe if they have something in common. Now, if you have a separable Hilbert space with a unitary operator, then each such operator is determined by two objects. The first of them is uh, the maximal spectral type. It has a certain measure on a circle. I'm not uh, going to go into details, but uh, well, with each L2 function, you can associate a measure, and in a sense, there is the largest of them. So this is this maximal spectral type. And another uh, thing you need to know to determine your operator is a spectral multiplicity function, which is some function from the circle to, to natural numbers. Is uniquely determined means up to conjugation? Or? Yeah. So in uh, uh, ergodic theory, everything is up to isomorphism. And uh, what I mean by isomorphism depends uh, on what kind of objects uh, I deal at the moment. Uh, all right, so notice that, it, that, that the characteristic function of the whole space is always UT invariant. So it is convenient to consider the subspace of L2 that consists of functions of uh, zero integral. So uh, we do this to get rid of the atom of this maximal spectral type uh, at uh, point one, which will always be there. So they, all these spectral measure, measure ha, measures have this atom in common, so let's just get rid of this. And now we say that T and S are spectrally disjoint if their spectral measures or are, I could say, disjoint, let's say mutually singular, of course, after restriction of our Koopman operators to these L2 zero subspaces. Why am I talking about this? Well, spectral disjointness implies disjointness. So if I want examples on the measure theory, uh, on the level of measure theoretical dynamical systems, I can start with looking for something on the spectral level. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, not vice versa. So these notions are not the same. However, there are cases when they are, are the same. So suppose, for example, that T is ergodic and has discrete spectrum. This means that uh, your spectral measure is discrete or equivalently you can think of compact abelian group rotations. Then disjointness is the same as spectral disjointness. So it can happen. Okay, so what Saranac's conjecture has to do with joining disjointness? Let's take a look. So you have already, you have already seen the statement uh, I'm not going to repeat all the details, it's just that we have uh, a de deterministic topological dynamical systems and we produce sequences from the system using continuous functions and we want all these sequences. Well, the assertion is uh, that all such se all sequences <coughs> produced this way are orthogonal to the Mebius function. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, let x mu be the orbit closure of the Mebius function under the left shift. So uh, this is the world uh, everything lives in. And now we want to interpret these averages. So instead uh, of, of this expression, I will have uh, integrals of f times pi zero, where pi, where pi zero is just taking the zero coordinate of your sequence with respect to such an empiric measure. Okay, but if I pass to a subsequence, they, I, then I know that this converges to something. So the space of this measure is compact. Uh, there, will be a con there, will, there will be convergence along uh, a subsequence. And this limit measure, well, its projection onto the first coordinate will be a measure invariant under T. Uh, you have seen this on Mario's slides. And uh, on the second coordinate, we will have a measure that is invariant under the left shift. So we get a joining of some invariant measure of 4T. And for this, uh, we'll say Mebius system. So in order to prove the validity of Sarnak's conjecture, it is enough to show that such integrals vanish 
for any row that arises this way. Well, it seems hard. It is hard. So studying Furstenberg systems uh, of the Mebius functions is definitely a non-trivial task. There, are, uh, there is progress in these directions, but this is not uh, what I'm talking about today. So what I'm interested in is how to apply Katai's orthogonality criterion. So somehow instead of looking at mu, I'm looking at the sequences. Uh, I want to be orthogonal to mu. Uh, okay, so here I put uh, again the, the statement and let us try to understand it in terms of joinings. So in order to, to apply this to Sarnax conjecture, we just take a of n equal to f of t and x, and capital F is the Mebius function. So these averages, these are just integrals of f times f, f with respect to such empiric measures, and we do the same trick. So we pass to a subsequence. Uh, this uh, will converge to something, and this will be again a joining. A joining of what? We need to look at the first and at the second coordinate. So on the first coordinate, we'll have something that is invariant under T2P, and on the second coordinate, we'll have something that is invariant under T2Q. So we need to show that such integrals vanish for any row that arises this way. That's, that's what we have, uh, that's uh, possibly an easier task than proving uh, this jointness from Sarnath's conjecture directly. Sometimes it's easier than studying first inverse systems of mu. This, this depends, of course, on the system you start with. Okay, so for example, if T is uniquely ergodic with the unique measure, well, mu, which is not the Mebius function, and I'm sorry, I'm not using both face, so you have to be uh, careful. And suppose that T, P, and T, Q are disjoint or spectrally disjoint, then what, uh, what this measure row can be? Well, this measure row is a joining of T to P and T to Q. So if they are disjoint, there is just one possibility. And since we are only interested in functions whose integral vanishes, this will imply that Sarnak conjecture holds. So, so if we can find examples of uh, measure theoretical, well, of uh, topological dynamical systems that uh, uh, are uniquely ergodic and TP and T to P and T, T to Q are disjoint and, or spectrally disjoint, then we are fine. So this will uh, give us, this will already give us examples uh, of systems for which Sarna conjecture holds. So what do we have there? Well, the list is long. I'm just going to give uh, uh, some examples so that you get an idea what can happen. So the first thing to say is that typical automorphism satisfies this. Then, for example, you can find a large subclass of rank one system. So this is, uh, this is a certain way of producing dynamical systems uh, that have some properties that you want. And uh, then we have, for example, three interval exchange transformation that are known to have sufficiently many prime powers pairwise disjoint. So this is a kind of warning uh, because I told you, so in the way I formulated Katai's orthogonality criterion, so there was an assumption that some averages go to zero for all distinct pairs of P's and Q's. So this does not have to be this way. You can skip some price. How many? Unclear. So finitely many for sure. Uh, with larger subsets, you have to be careful. And actually, I'm not sure if it's known how far this can be pushed. So this would be one of uh, open problems, how many pairs of primes you can actually skip and in what sense. And, well, I could continue. But let's go to concrete examples. Let's take the easiest uh, dynamical system uh, from this point of view. This will be irrational rotation. And let us notice first that it suffices to prove uh, the assertion of Cernak's conjecture for a linearly dense set of functions, since we can add things up, we can pass to the limit. So if we do this for every f and every x, 
will be fine. The second remark is that if our system is uniquely ergodic, then actually it suffices to check uh, the assertion for a subset that is linearly dense in L1 of mu. And finally, something that already appeared, since we know that the averages of the Mebius function go to zero by the prime number theorem, uh, Sarna conjecture holds for, well, constant functions. So we can assume that our functions are of zero average. And let's go to irrational rotation. So <coughs> everything lives on a circle. We have an, I didn't write this, but write this, but alpha is an irrational number and we just rotate. So one could say that uh, Katai's criterion is not necessary. We have this estimate of Davenport that uh, were already on major slides and that's it. But you can also do it by hand. You don't need speed, you just need convergence. So you can do it uh, by hand using Katai's criterion. So the functions that we will take, these are just trigonometric uh, polynomials. This is x of uh, 2 pi i k x, where k is an integer, and we just plug this in. So nothing is really happening here. This goes to zero. And small warning. This doesn't, doesn't work for all continuous functions. So you can construct continuous functions for which uh, this fails. So this can be done using Fourier analysis. But this doesn't mean that Sarnak fails. It just means that this criter criterion does not work. And uh, fortunately, we don't need uh, to check this criterion for all functions, but we can pick a sufficiently large family of nice functions. So this, this is uh, the advantage that we have. All right, so the next example is more complicated. I will not tell you all the details. This is just to illustrate and give you some, well, classical examples from this theory. So suppose that uh, we have a discrete subgroup with a finite covolume of uh, PSL2R. We look at the quotient space, and on this quotient space, there are two particular flows. The first of them is the core cycle flow, which acts this way. And there is also the geodesic flows, flow, which acts this way. And there is the following relation between them, which from the dynamical point of view means that the horocycle flow and its linear time change are isomorphic, whatever positive number I put here in front of T. Okay, so let us go first to the conclusion. Horocycle flow satisfies Cernic's conjecture. This is deep complicated, don't ask me, ask the authors. But what is of my interest now is this version of ortho Katai's orthogonality criterion proved by Borgen, Cernic, and Ziegler. So A is a bounded arithmetic function, F is uh, a multiplicative function bounded by one, and the assertion is the same. What changes? We have this, these two limb soups. So this is uh, related to this warning I gave you when I talked about interval exchange transformation. So this is a more subtle version of uh, what I have showed you. And how do they prove their result? Well, Radner's theory tells us that each pair of points where you put the same on the first and second coordinate is generic for an ergodic joining of T to P and T to Q, and then you need to, to have more knowledge uh, about how these joinings look like. So th this is uh, something non-trivial. Okay, so let's talk about something different. So this will be ANSI skew products. So this is a completely different class of dynamical systems. Uh, and it goes this way. So suppose you have an, well, let's say irrational number, you have a function h from the circle to the circle, and you consider skew products like this. The difficulty in studying such systems lies in the fact that the empiric measures may not converge. So this is already Furstenberg, 1961. So this tells you it's not going to be easy. However, if we know something more about the regularity of H, we can actually prove the assertion of Cernak's conjecture. So 
if H is of class C to one plus epsilon, then for a topologically generic set of alphas, certain conjecture holds. Well, this is not a very strong assumption, so let's. Uh, so this is not a very strong assumption, but we don't get all alphas, so that's uh, that's the problem with uh, with this theorem. So let us assume more about H. If we know that it's analytic and there is uh, some technical extra condition here, then the result is also true. And in fact, this uh, extra condition can be dropped. Uh, so Wang showed that if H is analytic, then T satisfies certain next conjecture. And in the uniquely ergodic case, which means that these averages do converge, he uh, uses Kata's orthogonality criterion. In the non-uniquely ergodic case, he uses a certain bound on, on short interval averages of multiplicative functions. So this is really much more uh, complicated. And there was further progress uh, in this class of dynamical system using, systems using other methods. So the result is true for all uh, functions uh, infinitely differentiable and actually of all functions of class C to 2 plus epsilon, and uh, this can be strengthened to C2, 1 plus epsilon, and this seems to be the limit for now. All right. I still have some time, that's good. So let us talk now about a joining version of Katai's orthogonality criterion. Since I like to translate everything into joinings, let's try with this. We will say that uh, a measure theoretic dynamical system has asymptotically orthogonal powers if, of, if for any f, f, f and g square integrable with uh, zero average, <coughs> we have the following. So what is happening here? Here we are looking at integrals of f times g with respect to rho. This looks familiar. So before we had f times f, and there were measures rho arising in a special way as limits of these empiric measures after passing to a subsequence. And uh, if you remember, these limits were always some joinings of uh, two systems. That's why there is a supremum here over jo all possible joinings of T to P and T to Q. So, Probably I could put here dot all joinings, but joinings arising in this special way. But since it's hard to describe joinings arising in this special way, we just have all possible joinings between T2P and T2Q. And here we have this limit. So this limit, this is something similar to, to the limb soup from this criterion. So actually, if you rewrite this using the distance uh, that you can define on the set of joining. This is what you will get. This property implies zero entropy and total ergodicity. And what is interesting is that you can have T such that uh, all powers, all prime <coughs> powers are isomorphic, but still this property holds. So <coughs> that's, uh, yes? Sorry, can you uh, explain this limit? Uh, you want me to explain the ingredients in this limit? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I said, so in order to prove either Sarnak's conjecture or the assumptions of Katai's orthogonality criterion. So when we translate these two things in the language of joinings, after some uh, modifications, always at the end, we have something called the for integral of some function with respect to measure rho that arises in a special way. Uh, and this measure rho is always a joining of two things. So if you think of Katai's orthogonality criterion, this is a joining of T to P and T to Q a special joining, which is a limit along a subsequence, blah, blah, blah. So here we could have a supremum over such joinings. But since it's hard to understand which joinings arise this way and which don't, we just uh, have the supremum over all joinings here. This is, this is what uh, uh, this notion is. 
Okay, and if you assume that your system is uniquely ergodic and has this property, then it satisfies Saranac's conjecture. So this, this goes actually via this Borgen Saranac Ziegler orthogonality criterion. You just, well, just translate it to the joining language. All right. <coughs> Uh, okay, so you can ask the following question. So suppose that uh, um, Saranac conjecture, no, I should start at the beginning. I wanted to be quicker, but it does, this doesn't work. Okay, so let us recall that a topological dynamical system is uniquely ergodic if there is only one invariant measure. And we call a topological dynamical system a uniquely ergodic model of some given fixed measure theoretical dynamical system. If this topological system is uniquely ergodic and these two, these two systems treated as measure theoretical dynamical systems are isomorphic. So you see, Cernak's conjecture is defined in terms of topological dynamics, but you have seen that well, we play with measures quite a lot, so it's natural to take a measure theoretical dynamical system and start wondering in what sense it could satisfy Saranac's conjecture. And you have seen that almost everywhere convergence is not a problem, so we cannot really stay in this measure theoretic setting. We need to go to the topological setting, and that's why this comes up. Okay, so let me remind you that each measure theoretic system has a uniquely ergodic model. So this is not, not a bad uh, approach. This, it makes sense uh, to study this problem from this point of view. And uh, these uniquely ergodic models can be fairly complicated, even if your system is not complicated. So suppose you have just a one point system. So we have a singleton and, well, there's no action, right? There, there is just the identity action. So one can show that uh, each topological dynamical system that has a fixed point such that for any x, t and x goes to x0 along some subset of natural numbers of full density is a uniquely ergodic model of this one point system. So you have to be careful. These things get complex pretty easily. And to give you just one more example, Sturmian systems are uniquely ergodic models of irrational rotations. This, this is what it is. And now it's reasonable, reasonable to ask, so suppose certain conjecture holds in some uniquely ergodic model of your measure theoretical uh, system. Does it hold in all uniquely ergodic models? So can you pass from one model to the other? And uh, the result is, as follows, so suppose that we have asymptotic orthogonality of power, so this joining version of Katai's orthogonality criterion. Then it turns out that the answer is positive. So this, this is a pretty strong notion because you deal with many systems at once. Okay, so more examples. Uh, Quasi-discrete spectrum automorphism. This is something that generalizes uh, discrete spectrum. So maybe let me skip this part. Let me tell you what the theorem is. So these systems uh, enjoy the uh, asymptotic orthogonality of powers property. So in particular, all their uniquely ergodic... Do they hear us? I think so. Cave, you can hear us, right? No. Yes, yes, we can hear. All right, so in particular, all uniquely ergodic models of quasi-discrete spectrum automorphism satisfy Cernak's conjecture. Okay, so what are these systems? So if T is a quasi-discrete spectrum automorphism, and actually up to a measure of theoretic isomorphism, we can assume that uh, X is a compact connected abelian group, so we can think, for example, of a two torus. And our map is of the form, well, Tx is equal to Ax plus B, where A is a continuous group automorphism and B is just some elements. For example, you can think of x, y goes to x plus alpha, uh, y plus 
x. And then there are two, two technical conditions that are related to, to the ergodicity and total ergodicity. So let me skip this. So for these al algebraic models of quasi-discrete spectrum automorphism, the validity of Cernak's conjecture was known earlier, but it wasn't clear if uh, this holds in any model. Okay, so another class. So you see this world is rich. You can pick your favorite dynamical system and start working. So what is interesting, so that, that was the approach in the early days after uh, Sarnak formulated his conjecture. So people just picked systems they understood well and they did various things. But as you see, there, there is some common denominator to all of this. So maybe there is hope, I don't know. Okay, so what do we have now? Uh, G is a connected, simply connected nilpotently group and we have a lattice. So we can think of, a, of uh, the Heisenberg group and discrete uh, Heisenberg subgroup. And each rotation on the quotient space uh, of this form is called a nil rotation. That's one class of systems. And the other one are affine unipotent deformorphisms. So if you know what this is, then Great, if you don't, I don't think my explanation will help much. So <laughs> you have these two famous classes and for both of them, we know that Cernak conjecture holds. And actually there is more. So ergodic affine unipotent defaults do have asymptotic orthogonality of powers. So in this case, we know that Cernak conjecture holds uh, in all uniquely ergodic models. Okay, so maybe, okay, I, that was a spoiler. <laughs> Maybe asymptotic orthogonality of powers is always true. I mean, maybe one can try to prove that this, for example, follows, I don't know, from zero entropy and total ergodicity. Who knows? Well, this is not the case. So let me remind you the relation between the geodesic and the coral cycle flow. So we have this. So now suppose that you have well, let's say two different primes, such that, uh, well, two sequences of primes. So P goes to infinity, Q goes to infinity, and P over Q goes to one. And we can take U such that P is equal to E to minus two U Q. So, so since P over Q goes to one, this means that U is close to zero. So, Look, here we have this relation between the horocycle and geodesic flow. U is close to zero, so this is somehow almost identity. So this uh, geodesic flow actually defines a joining uh, between uh, HP and HQ. This is a graph joining. This means that you just have a measure in this product space which lives on a graph. Since uh, u is small, you can assume that it's between 0 and 1. So everything is happening in this set of joinings, which is a compact set. And since the product measure is not in this set, the distance between the product measure and this whole set is positive. And this is why the asymptotic orthogonality of powers does not hold. So, okay, we don't have this, but maybe there is some other more subtle version of asymptotic orthogonality of powers. Maybe this is not the right notion yet. So that's one problem. And actually it even remains open whether Cernak's, con Cernak's conjecture holds in all uniquely ergodic models of horocycle flows. We don't have methods for this so far. And let me stop here. Thank you.